Hey, what's up, Spencer? My name's everybody, and welcome to my holiday vlog. Today is Friday, December 22nd, and I am having a late start to my day. I'm actually pretty tired because I got up really late this morning because yesterday me and my roommate had our winter solstice holiday party in which I spent all day cooking and cleaning, and then we spent hours watching all sorts of Christmas movies and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun, but I was so busy I couldn't end up recording any of it. But this morning I had to get up and bring my roommate to the airport so she could spend time with her family, and then I have this next four days or so by myself, so I am spending it doing this reading vlog. <laughs> Now what are we going to be reading? I have two books that I am currently reading. The first one is... I don't remember the name of it. It's the third book in the Crown of the Feather series. Shadow is in the name somewhere. I'm about two-thirds of the way through this book right now. I am listening to it on audiobook. Audiobook? And I'm hoping that I'm going to finish it today. I am also reading Citizen 865. This is a book about the hunt for Nazis who had escaped to America after World War II. I am about 30 pages into this so far. It's pretty interesting. Still right at the very beginning, so not really. We haven't gotten into very much so far, but I am interested to get more into it. Right now, it's like 12 30 in the afternoon and I haven't had breakfast or anything yet so right now I'm gonna sit I'm gonna drink some coffee I'm gonna eat some Einstein bagel I'm gonna watch some book miss videos and then I'm gonna get to cleaning there's a lot of stuff that needs to be cleaned after the party I have so much the kitchen is a mess several people spilled drinks yesterday so the floor is sticky there is just so much to do. and what a morning it has been. You guys saw me drop my cinnamon rolls. Thankfully I was able to save them and they were still pretty good, yay. So this morning I did actually start watching the HBO Max Love Has One documentary and that is very interesting. I'm about halfway through it right now. Cults are a very interesting thing to look into. If you are somebody who thinks that you could never get sucked into a cult, then you are absolutely wrong because anybody can get sucked into a cult. It just takes the right people saying the right things and you happening to be in the right place. In many ways, so many things 
already that we participate in are very cult-like. If you think about it, like, just the concept of families can be very culty because in order to be a part of a family you have to participate in these, like, specific set of rules and if you don't follow the rules then typically you'll get kicked out of the family or be shunned from the family. And in many ways you'll be expected to kind of, like, give up yourself for the good of, like, the entire family and stuff like that. Once you start thinking about it, we are all very susceptible to cults. Speaking of cults, um, this Nazi book that I have been reading, I am about 55 pages into it, going a little bit slow. Usually for me, things with, that are nonfiction take a little bit longer because even though the subject matter will be interesting to me, it can also be written in a very dry way that makes it take longer. And that is definitely what's going on here, especially... I'm not 100% sure what the intention for the author is because it really feels as though she's jumping around a lot. There doesn't seem to be like a specific narrative that we are currently following. Like we are not following specifically like one Nazi that we are hunting or like one person who is hunting Nazis, like, we are, I have learned about so many different things already in a way that feels very overwhelming and kind of like, all right, what are you, but what are you trying to, like, say, though? Like, yes, it's good and important that we, like, hunted all of the Nazis that moved here uh, after the war and stuff like that, and unfortunately we did not get them all, but also, like, what specific, what's, what are you trying to tell us with this? I don't know. I also finished Wing of Shadow, I believe is the name. It is the third book in the Crown of Feather series, which I don't think that I explained what the plot of this kind of series is. It follows a fantasy world in which phoenixes are very prominent and very similar to a lot of the dragon rider type books that are out there, similar to Aragon. Uh, there are Phoenix Riders, except there has been kind of like a mass extinction of Phoenix Riders, and our main character, Veronica, wants to become a Phoenix Rider, but is unable to because there are so few, and currently only boys are allowed to become Phoenix Riders, so she has to kind of do the whole Mulan thing to become a Phoenix Rider, and it's very good, gets very deep into a lot of things because she has a whole entire history, her sister has a whole history and all sorts of stuff. Very good. The third one, I am giving it 3.75 stars overall. For a book that is very based on like war and battle and stuff like that, this book did end up becoming very character heavy and character based, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just can get a little bit boring for me personally. So I wish that there was like a little bit more action and stuff like that going on, but overall I really liked this series and I do highly recommend it. And I did also start The Drowned Woods by Emily Lloyd-Jones and got about 70 pages into this. The best way that I think to describe this book would be it is kind of like Avatar The Last Airbender meets Ocean's Eleven, in which our main character, Mare, is a water dowser, water diviner, where she basically can bend water. She's the last of her kind, and she has been coveted by a evil prince, but has escaped and is now hiding in secret. But the prince's spy master kind of comes and finds her and is like, hey, I got one last job for you. If we get together a team and kind of go after this like magical well, this is what gives the evil prince like all of his power. So if we get rid of this well, we can take him down once and for all. And then like you can live in peace for the rest of your life. So that is what is going on. I think that it's pretty interesting. I'm enjoying it so far. I am going to start for an audiobook next, Cherish Farah. I don't remember anything at all what this book is about. All I know is that it is a thriller, so I am interested to get into it. I am going to be headed out to the Arsenal right now, which is kind of like this 
place in Denver that is acres and acres of land that you can just drive through and there are all sorts of like buffalo and prairie dogs and like animals and stuff like that. So I am gonna go and do that while listening to Cherish Farah and then come back here and kind of tell you about it. <laughs> the arsenal and while I was out I was able to get through about the first third of Cherish Fara and I am absolutely TNFing this book. I am floored by the fact that on Storygraph this was tagged as a fast-paced thriller because absolutely nothing is happening in this book. So this book is about our main character, Farah, who is a rich black girl who is best friends with a girl named Cherish, who is also a rich black girl. Um, and that's kind of it. Yeah, I've been listening to the past like three and a half, four hours of this audiobook and it, nothing is going on. I cannot sympathize with or identify with anything that Farah has to say because what she is saying and what is actually going on in the story seems to be two huge different things. There seems to be a mass amount of cognitive dissonance going on and like not in a way where it seems like the reader is supposed to be like aware that what the main character is thinking isn't correct kind of like in like stories where like the main character kind of like stalks people like you. It's just really weird because Far's whole entire thing is like, yeah, she's rich, but she's not as rich as Cherish. And like, that's a whole entire issue and that's a whole entire thing. And so everything that she keeps on talking about and complaining about, Farah talks so much, but she doesn't say jack shit. Everything that she's talking about, she talks about how her mom lost her job, about how they're selling their childhood home, about how they might have to new move to a new state so that her dad can get a new job, and how she's like really upset that her family has kind of been treating her like a kid and hasn't been like upfront with her about those things, which like, yeah, it's all valid things to be upset about, but none of those things are like actual problems. That's just the way that life works. Like, yeah, it sucks that you gotta sell your house, but sometimes that's the way that it works. Yeah, it sucks that your mom lost her job, but that's just life, babe. Like, nothing that you are talking about is anything of actual concern. 
Like, it's not like they're gonna be homeless now. It's not like they have so little money that they're like living out of their car or anything like that. Like, Farah has a home to go to. Her parents are renting a full house, but she's staying with Cherish because it's just gonna be easier and Cherish is so much richer and stuff like that. So, nothing that Farah is complaining about lands with me. Like, it feels so weird as a unemployed trans man who lost his job because of transphobia and has been homeless in the past year, it just feels like there's so much cognitive dissonance going on for this character to be like, yeah, I'm rich enough that my house has five bathrooms, but I'm black, so clearly, like, I'm super disadvantaged and, like, underprivileged and stuff. Like, yes, being black definitely has disadvantages to it, but she is residing in a world that is so much different than mine and exists in such a different realm than mine that everything that she is complaining about just makes me want to, like, smack her because it's not a real issue. Like, yeah, it sucks that you're gonna have to move to a different state and that your best friend can't come with you and stuff, but that that's just sometimes how shit works, girl. <laughs> I wish that I could really, like, see the things that Farrah is, like, complaining about because she'll mention things about being like, oh, I'm the only black girl, like, at this school, and so, like, I get microaggressed all the time, except we never see it. She's always complaining about these things, but we never actually see her. So it doesn't feel like it's an actual issue to the character. I'm sure that she is genuinely getting microaggressed every single day, but when she just says it, but we don't see her actually struggling with those things, it doesn't feel like it's a genuine problem. Like, none of these things that she is bringing up seem to be, like, true issues. And thus, I just, I can't deal with her. I can't deal with the story. It is so boring. Nothing is happening. The entire thing that Farrah right now is, like, having an issue about is, like, her best friend Cherish has a birthday that extends for three whole days and they do stuff for three days and Farrah is just rich enough that all she gets to do on her birthday is fly to another city and buy a bunch of party dresses and stuff. Like, oh my god. Shut up. All right, what I am doing now, I'm gonna eat some food and then I'm gonna try and read a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of manga. I really want to finish... Demon Slayer. I think that I am on volume 19, which means I only have four more volumes to get through before I hit the actual end, and I want to finish it before the next season of Demon Slayer comes out, which is going to be in a few weeks. I also have the first three volumes of I Think Our Son Is Gay, so I'm going to be diving into that and probably reading some more of The Drowned Woods and some other stuff. Merry Christmas! It is officially Christmas Eve and I'm gonna be spending today by myself doing my own thing because I don't have any friends or family. And I know it'll probably sound pretty dramatic for me to say that, but it is true. I have a roommate, but like I said, she is spending time with her family in a completely different state. I recently had friends, but very recently lost all of them because of a really, really stupid reason. And technically, I have two people who are related to me, but because the third person who kind of existed in our family recently passed away, they don't really see the value in including me in family things anymore. And it could be very easy to fall into the loneliness and the depression that can come with that. I've had a 
really, really, really hard year. I think this past year has been one of the worst years that I have gone through. I lost my job because of a mass amount of transphobia. Like I said, I lost my friends. I lost the one family member who I still like really felt kind of genuinely cared about me and I'm just by myself and in many ways it could be very 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 easy to let my depression and other mental illness stuff really get me down and it has lately. It would be a lie to try and pretend like I have been okay recently because I absolutely have not. But it is also in times like this in when I really realize how much I do enjoy spending time by myself and doing my own thing. When I was at the Arsenal yesterday, it was just... I just had such a nice time there and I knew a big part of the reason was because it was something that I was doing that I enjoyed and I didn't need to try and spend any time thinking about other people. I like other people, I love spending time with other people, but also there's just so much that comes with having to be around other people and having to constantly check in with other people and defer to things that other people want to do. So just being able to find pure joy in being able to do whatever I want at any given second. If I want to pull over and I want to go on like a little hike around this lake right now, I can do that and I don't need to like ask somebody else if they also want to do that. And just all of these things. I don't know. I have spent a lot of time by myself in the past year and just in general and so I really have learned how to take a lot of joy out of doing things on my own and for myself and so I'm kind of just trying to spend this time really getting back into that and not letting my depression dragged me down the way that it has in kind of the past, oof, the past year has been tough. So with that, what are we doing today? Because I have been trying to give myself like a good fun activity to do like every single day of this vlog. Yesterday we went to the Arsenal. Today we are going to go and see The Boy and The Heron. I am so excited because I am absolutely obsessed with Ghibli films. I love Ghibli movies and usually I only want to see things in the original Japanese but I am so enamored with Robert Patterson's performance as The Heron that I am also compelled to watch it in English. I don't think that I'm going to do both today. I think I'm going to do just the Japanese today and then maybe in like a week or so go back and do the English. I don't think that I can watch them like back to back double feature like that because it's the same exact movie. But that's what I'm planning on doing today. 4.30 going to see the Japanese version of The Boy and the Heron. Last night for my reading I was able to finish volumes 19, 20, and 21 of Demon Slayer and then I needed to put 22 on on hold because somebody else was reading that one and I wasn't able to do it. I am highly anticipating the upcoming arc of Demon Slayer that is coming out because this is the last arc before the big final fight. And the thing that I have to say is the ending does feel kind of rushed even though the last like 10 volumes of the manga is the whole entire final arc fight. It does feel a little bit rushed that we're already here. We are already at the final fight. It kind of feels like there was more that could have been explored and uncovered and characters that we could have met, but it's okay. It's fine. I'm just kind of coming to terms with the fact that it's gonna be over soon. I can't believe it. I don't know how long it's gonna take them to make the final arc. I assume that it's gonna take them a while because it is a very long arc because there are so many high-ranking demons that are being fought and everybody's fighting, but I'm excited for it. With the Drowned Wood, 
I am about halfway through this book and I'm liking it but also at the same time I am quite disappointed because Emily Lloyd-Jones has made some decisions for her characters, especially Fade specifically, but has not fully committed to these decisions that she has made. I haven't really talked about Fade yet. Fade is kind of like our male love interest character who works with Mare, where he was originally working for the Fae for seven years. And he has this kind of like magical curse slash gift that was given to him where he has the ability to just beat somebody to death. As soon as he starts like fighting somebody, they're gonna die. There's no way for them to get out of it. That's just like kind of the curse slash gift is he has the ability to kill people and you will die once he starts doing that. But the thing is, is he's trying to say that this is a curse that is so sensitive that were he to even accidentally like bump into somebody, it can trigger it and he will accidentally like beat an innocent person to death on the street. Except he's never done that. He's never had a time in which he has accidentally bumped into someone and has triggered it. He doesn't have any scenes in which he is like desperately fighting himself to get away from this person that he has accidentally triggered his curse on. He doesn't have any trauma in which he accidentally like killed somebody that he really cared about and stuff like that and so it doesn't feel as though the author has fully committed to this choice because now Fade is trying to say like oh Mare I want to get close to you but I can't because like my curse could hurt you when that doesn't feel true because we haven't seen that at all. I wish that that is what was going on because I love when we grab something really messed up and like really go hard into it but it feels like the author didn't want to fully go into that because then it would make Fade like too gray and maybe the reader wouldn't feel as though he's redeemable if he had actually like killed innocent people but I feel like that's kind of like a cop-out and stuff especially like for Mare uh they're trying to say that like oh she's somebody who is brutal enough that she would be able to like kill Fade if he like really got out of control when that doesn't feel true for me because she hasn't shown anything. She hasn't killed anybody on her own. She passively took place in like this murder. She didn't even have like a direct hand in it. She just happened to provide information and she is so torn up over this having killed people who she doesn't even know and not even directly that that tells me that absolutely not. She could not directly kill somebody who she has feelings for if their curse got out of control. So I wish that the author had gone harder into it. I wish that Mare had like directly taken a lot of people's lives because then that would have been so interesting because both Mare and Fade could feel as though because they're killers that they're not deserving of love and that they like can't really like nobody would be able to understand them because they've been forced into these circumstances and then when they meet each other they realize that oh this is the only other person who could truly understand what it means to have been forced to kill someone even though that like wasn't your choice. But that isn't really what's going on here and that makes me really disappointed because the characters feel so flat and lackluster and when the author is trying to create drama and tension between them it doesn't feel like there actually is because she hasn't gone hard enough into the stakes. So yeah, those are kind of my thoughts on The Drowned Woods so far. Uh, halfway through it, um, we're continuing with more telling instead of showing because we, we have now met Mare's ex. But if the author hadn't specifically told me that this person was Mare's ex, I would never have known based on the way that they interact. They just interact as like regular friends. They don't interact as ex-lovers. It's kind of weird. Hopefully they'll get more into it, but yeah. I also still have I think our son is gay hoping to jump into these today. I'm very excited about them because these seem super cute and wholesome. <laughs>
officially Christmas. I meant to check in yesterday when I got home from watching The Boy and the Heron, but I ended up not doing that because my neighbors were totally blasting music. And it was like 7.30, hadn't eaten dinner yet, and then by the time I finished, I was so tired, I just needed to go to bed. We are getting into the time of year in which it is almost impossible for me to function past 4.30 because once the sun has gone down, I am just done. And this is tough time of year for me to try and do anything. <laughs> Let's talk about the boy and the heron. I, oh my goodness, that was a whole entire experience. One, I am never getting to a theater early ever again. This movie was supposed to start at 4.30, so I show up at like 4.15. The movie did not start until 5 o'clock. They made us watch almost an hour's worth of commercials, not even trailers, commercials before they actually started playing the movie. I am never showing up early to a movie ever again. That was the worst decision that I made. Once we actually got into the movie though, it was great. It was long. It was a solid two hours. It ran from five to seven, so a full two hour movie. And it was pretty good. Not my favorite. Graveyard of the Fireflies will probably always be my number one Ghibli favorite, but this one was very good. There was a lot going on. There were a lot of different elements. A little bit slow because like it was a full hour before we even got into like the more spirited away type part of the movie where Mahiko like goes into the tower and goes more into this like fantastical world. We have a whole hour beforehand where Mahiko is like putting together this bow and arrow set and stuff like that that he can use to try and kill the heron. And I really wish during this part of the movie there had been a little bit more of an emphasis on the war. This is like a historical fantasy where they mention the war, but they do not say what exactly this war is. I am assuming that it is World War II that we are referencing, but they never say anything besides three years after the start of the war, mom died and we moved from Tokyo. And then two years after the war ended, we moved back. That's the extent of it. And they kind of like reference the fact, the factory that the dad works at and they're kind of like building plane parts and stuff. So I wish that there had been a bit more about what the actual war was or like its effect and stuff like that. But besides that, it was really good. I am excited to go back and see the English version with Robert Pattinson because my one of my biggest issues a lot with English voice acting is that when they choose the English voice actors, there will be several times in which they don't really pick the best person. And so the voice, it doesn't match the character and I can't do that. But Robert Patterson definitely did good job, got the voice very similar to what the original like Japanese version is. Now, getting into actual books. The Drowned Woods. I finished The Drowned Woods officially and I'm going to be giving this book two and a half stars. This actually was a big disappointment for me. When I first went into it, I was really liking it. And by the time we got to the end, I was like, this is dumb. The ending for this book is stupid. Because once we got like 80% of the way through and the author is starting to like reveal these twists and stuff like that, they were bad twists because she didn't set them up at all. They just came out of nowhere. Like, Fane had like a whole like weird betrayal thing that he kind of did, but there was never any sort of like hit. We had all of these chapters that were like from his point of view and stuff like that. And there was never any time in which he was like, oh, like I'm keeping something. Nope. He just out of nowhere is like, oh yeah, I'm actually a double agent or something like that. I've had this whole secret secondary uh, motivation this whole entire time. Like, what? No. I don't know. It's, it, 
ended poorly enough that I actually wouldn't really recommend this book, which is why it's two and a half stars. There, Emily Lloyd Jones did not commit, and she really needed to commit more to the decisions that she made in this story. I also read the first three volumes of I Think Our Son is Gay, and I gave all three of them five stars. There are a total of five volumes currently in this series. I believe that the author is still working on it and still putting out more volumes, but I definitely need to read volumes four and five because this is a super cute manga. It is from the point of view of this mother who her son is very obviously gay because he'll like mess up and like make these comments all the time but he always like backtracks and be like oh no no like uh the mom will be like oh that guy on tv is cute and he'll be like nah I don't really think so oh well you know like based on the things that the girls in my class say like I don't really think that he's that cute like I heard the other girls say that they think that this other guy is like cuter and stuff like that so he's kind of like very obvious about it but still not super comfortable enough to really be fully out and so the mom is kind of just trying to be nice and encouraging and supporting like when she can tell that he's disappointed by the fact that it's not normal for men to give other boys chocolate on Valentine's Day. She's encouraging him to do that because she knows that it would make him happy and he clearly has like a little crush on his friends that she like wants to encourage and stuff like that. And it's really interesting and really good because there's definitely like the dynamic of uh, dad isn't home all the time. He only comes home like once in a while. And when he does come home, he does say stuff that is like low-key homophobic. It, he'll be like, oh, all of these girls in my office are talking about this new show that's about, like, a romance between, like, two guys, and, like, that's okay, but I personally think that's really gross and stuff. And so the mom is kind of, like, trying to encourage him to say less homophobic stuff and encourage him to really open his mind to gay things so that when their son like does feel comfortable coming out to them then he'll be more accepting and stuff and I don't know just everything about it is super cute and just so adorable and I really like it and I just think like all the things that the mom is trying to do to try and low-key support her son and the way that she like thinks back to like raising her son and like all of these like interactions and stuff like that that they had when they were younger and like now what this means now that it's recontextualized that her son is gay and stuff just so much about it is so good and I highly recommend it it's oh just so adorable I also read the first volume of Hirano and Kag Kagura yeah Hirano and Kagura um this is okay it's about these two boys who are roommates and they are kind of sweet on each other. They kind of take care of each other and low-key have crushes on each other. And that's cute, but their dynamic like wasn't really all that. It's a very low-key dynamic, which for me isn't really doing it for me. I don't know. Like... <laughs> It's okay, but just isn't really me. <laughs> and last up, I started White Smoke by Tiffany D. Jackson. I believe this is the fourth book of hers that I have read. I am only about two chapters, like 35 pages into it, but I'm still really liking it so far. It is about this girl where she and her mixed family, her black mom has remarried to a white man. And so now she has a couple of white siblings and there's a whole n new family dynamic and they have moved into a new home that seems to be haunted and is in this really weird neighborhood. It's supposed to be a part of this unique like artist collaborative where artists get to live in this neighborhood for free as long as they are producing art on a semi-regular basis and her mom is a author or something like that. So our main character moving into this new house has really high key anxiety 
and I'm just really liking what's going on so far because it seems very realistic. I really like the characterization that is going on and there does seem to be some good creepy elements. If you haven't read Tiffany D. Jackson before, you definitely should. A lot of her stuff is really good. The Weight of Blood is my favorite by her. It is a modern Carrie retelling where there's the added element of race to it and I thought that having that added element really made it very very good really added a lot to the story so today is actually Christmas what are we doing today not really much of anything I'm actually going to my dance teacher's house for kind of like a Christmas lunch but besides that that's kind of it so yeah, I guess I'll check in with you guys later. All right, update. Apparently we are not going to my dance teacher's house because she just texted me and told me that she is sick. And so they are going to be postponing the Christmas food party that they are having. So I guess I'm staying home and having a regular day today. just about come to the end of this holiday vlog. The only thing that I really need to check up on with you guys is since I last talked to you, I did start and finish Before I Let Go by Marie Nishkamp. I would have to say this is probably like the most like wintery-esque book that I have on my TBR. I don't really have a lot of like wintery Christmas time reads. And this is about our main character, Corey, who is going back to her small Alaskan hometown after being gone at a boarding school for the past seven months when her best friend tragically dies. And going into this book, I thought that this was going to be like kind of a sad, contemporary, character-driven book where it's about the main character kind of just like dealing with the grief and like processing the trauma of losing her best friend to mental illness. But no, there are aspects of like actual like thriller going on in here uh, where when Corey gets back to the town, she learns that this town, which had previously ostracized and treated her best friend horribly for having bipolar disorder, has now developed this weird almost cult-like relationship with her best friend and has a really weird perception of the fact that Kira killed herself. They say, you know, like, oh, it was her time. She foretold it. Like, all of these things that were just really weird. And Corey seems to be the only person who fully understands that Kira was struggling terribly with her mental illness and everybody like witnessed it and nobody did anything to try and help her with it. 
you know, usually with thrillers and stuff like that, the depiction of mental health isn't really the best and is usually used as kind of a scare. That isn't really true in this book at all. As somebody who has bipolar disorder, I found the representation of bipolar in this book to be very good. And I thought that this whole thing of the town like watching and just waiting and just letting her like die as her mental illness like consumed her and almost like portraying it as being like a good thing that this happened uh I felt was very realistic we can definitely like see that in a lot of things where we kind of value the traumatized artist the hurting artist and we really think that the only way to create good art is to be in a lot of pain like you can kind of see that with Vincent van Gogh where a lot of people will be like oh yeah like it really sucks that he struggled with mental illness but that's the reason why why he like created so many beautiful paintings without addressing the fact that most of his famous stuff actually came from the time of when he was in an actual psychiatric asylum and was getting actual like psychiatric help like uh, so I just found this book to be great, amazing. I gave it five stars. I loved it so much that I actually added several other things that this author has written to my TBR because I was like, wow, if this is the way that we are going to be portraying mental illness and also our main character is asexual, that was a great portrayal. I really liked that. If that's the things that like this author's writing about, I'm definitely interested to see what other things she has out there. Well, that is kind of the end of the vlog. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me. Like I said before, it's kind of been a really lonely past few days, but it's been a little bit better because I've been able to make this vlog and focus on the reading and some of the things that I just really enjoy doing on my own. So if you enjoyed this, make sure to like this video, comment down below, subscribe for more. But besides that, Remember to stay safe and have a fantastic day. Bye.